Wonderful, thanks. We just got a, t a tight session here, but we thought it was really important to to present on artificial intelligence. We've heard a lot about it over the past few days. Um, and the, this presentation really arose from a workshop that we had a couple of months ago uh, at the Australian Museum with Andrew and um, Paul and Jesse um, and a number of other people where we, we got around and uh, we got together and discussed uh, risks but also opportunities around AI. So there's absolutely no doubt that AI has the potential to, to radically transform our world. In fact, it's already doing so. In the field of citizen science, AI offers some extraordinary opportunities, from instant visual recognition of flora and fauna to the discovery of exoplanets. These same developments, however, raise numerous questions about the impact AI will have on our relationship with science and the natural world. So for the next 25 minutes or so, we'll explore the opportunities and risks surrounding AI. So I'd now like to introduce you to Andrew Robinson, the founder of Quest Game and a fellow at the Australian National University who will give us an overview. Welcome, Andrew. Yeah, it's, it's hard to uh, give um, an overview uh, in 10 minutes. So um, let me just uh, start, but I'll do my best I can. Um, uh, start my credentials are so that I'm a human. I, I don't have a chip in the back of my uh, neck, um, but uh, that's, that's one of my credentials. I try to be an independent thinker, um, but I am an AI developer and a uh, computer programmer, and I have a background in communication science. Um, the panel has been really uh, adamant about that I try to put a frame around AI because it's so big and whenever I talk about it I go off in all different directions. And they said, please, can you define this? So I'm going to just give it this. Um, getting software to perform a mental task previously performed by a human or group of humans. Um, what we're really talking about is machine learning. Um, and that is really computer vision, uh, object recognition, um, a, a little bit of acoustics recognition, and Jesse Oliver is going to talk a little bit about that as well. Paul and Andrew are going to talk about computer uh, vision and object uh, recognition, and then a few other uses of AI as well. So I just want you to look at this picture for a minute, and I want to ask how many people know uh, what album this was a cover image for. <laughs> okay, yes, we got a few here. Yes, this is Abbey Road. And how many people know the band, the name of the band? <laughs> yeah, yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so some of the latest computer vision t uh, technology that we have that's coming out of uh, Washington University, this was actually a, is an example of Darknet, which uses a um, YOLO grid system to actually identify objects, and is used by a lot of the visual uh, systems that are coming out onto the market, um, recognizes this as for human beings, right? And it's right. It is for human beings. And it also says that, you know, that's a tree and that's a car over there and maybe that's a street and maybe that's a sidewalk. But the point of this is that each one of us has a different reaction to this image and what it actually means. And the great uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, cognitive computer scientist Gerald Edelman said, every act of observation is an act of creation in the mind. And, uh, Someone like Amy, who studies a lot of uh, neuroscience, knows how the brain works and it starts to create things every time we make an observation. So it's really important to understand that each of us has a different reaction to what we observe, especially that's true when we talk about nature. Um, now, I'm not sure why all the, uh, the text has become dark. <laughs> you can't see the text. Uh, but anyways. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is an example of, of I'm going to talk about bad AI. This is bad artificial intelligence. This is an app called Plant Snap. And what this person is claiming is that you can now have a botanist in your pocket. Okay? Um, and if you looked at the app last year, they said that by the end of 2017, every plant on Earth would be recognizable by their app. 2017 ended. And we still have a huge percentage of plant species that have yet to be discovered. 
so this, this is the sort of char charlatanism that you really have to be careful about when we're talking about AI, okay? Another thing that's interesting is I caught him in the, in the act of sort of doing these air quotes when he was talking about other apps you submit to experts. So not only is he elevating the power of the phone to be better than any botanist, but he's also disparaging real botanists and real experts, right? <laughs> And this is a serious issue that we have to look, look out for. But there was a great uh, communication scientist named Marshall McLuhan. Maybe a lot of you have heard of him. He used to always say that the, the medium is the message. So when you point your phone at something, at a plant, say, and you take a picture of it, and it tells you what that plant is, that's not the message that you're getting. The message is actually the device that's telling you that this device, not your own brain, can fit in your hand and actually identify things for you. That's an important message that's actually coming out through the medium. It's okay, just something to think about. I'm hoping to raise more questions because I don't have answers here. So I'm hoping to raise questions. All right, so here might be another way to look at artificial intelligence and maybe a more positive way that it could be used. What we're looking at here is about 100 supercomputers, the most powerful supercomputers ever created. All right? Every one of us has a supercomputer that's more powerful than any computer on the planet. So if we wanted to say, okay, what is this thing, this crane fly here, maybe the AI could at least get it to this sort of level. I'm really sorry, but all my <laughs> the formatting has changed on this slide. Um, but could get it to sort of, this is a diptera species. Um, and uh, and uh, this is, uh, this, we, we know that. And then it can also do something that humans are really bad at. Because I look at all of you, I don't really know what you know. I know what you look like. And that causes problems, that causes biases. Humans tend to judge people by what, what you look like, how you behave, how you move, okay? But I don't know what you know inside your head, your expertise, all right? So the system could go, well, this person over here has demonstrated quite a lot of expertise in diptera. Not only that, but they're ready to help and identify this thing, and they're eager to do so. And this person over here has an eagerness and a passion to learn more about diptera. And what the AI in this example could do would be to connect people together, and we could be learning from each other. Okay, that's just an example. So I think um, some of the questions we need to be asking for every AI project is, first, could a human do this? Right? And second, would a human like to do this? And if so, are we allowing for that opportunity to happen? And there was a really interesting case with a Merlin uh, Bird ID, which is an artificial, bird, uh, artificial intelligence app that's meant to identify birds. So we took a survey and we asked people who were using it um, if you had the option between training the AI with your images or training other people, and it was just as easy and just as intuitive, which would you choose? Most of the people said, two-thirds of the people said, we'd rather train other people. Okay? So it's just an interesting insight. Um, and then you've got to ask, is it beneficial for humans to do this? Because sometimes it is beneficial for us to pass on knowledge from person to person, elders to younger people. Right? If the younger person sees the image of four people walking across a street, they're not going to get the cultural context that we all know. All right, what benefit and risks are there if humans don't do this, right? Um, what's the true cost for AI to do it? And this is really interesting. A lot of times we underestimate the true cost of AI. Again, Amy, in your talk yesterday, you were mentioning that it's like $21,000 a month. Was, was it $21,000? $21,000 a month to run these systems for the, to, to do a lot of the AI training. Um, but there's also cost. You've got to get AI developers. You've got to do all kinds of things. And, and maybe there's a lot of teachers out there that could be using that kind of investment. Um, and finally, are we implementing AI because it's the best possible solution or because everyone else is doing it, right? Uh, there was another example of a large AI identification project. I talked to the person, I said, why, why are you doing this? And his response was, um, because if we don't do it, everyone else is going to do it. Okay, so I don't know where, that, where you stop on that, right? Um, 
Okay, so I just want to end now uh, by saying uh, that AI, I don't think there's a threat that AI is going to hurt us. It's, out, it's not like a Terminator that's going to try to attack us. It's not going to become evil. But this philosopher said the real danger of AI is that we will overestimate the comprehension of our latest thinking tools, prematurely ceding authority to them far beyond their competence. Okay, it's just something to think about, and we'll pass it on to the other three times. Hi guys, so I'm Jesse Oliver, and a lot of you may have seen my talk yesterday, but I am researching citizen science design, and I particularly chose the challenge of acoustics, because I felt that acoustics, uh, we know they have really low participation. There's a lot of scope for finding cryptic species that vocalize, but you don't often see, or sneaky species as I like to call them. Um, and the thing is, I had no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea. I came from conservation biology. And I want to debunk one thing right now so nobody in this room will ever ask me, why don't you build a Shazam for wildlife? If people don't know what Shazam is, you record some music, and then it can identify on your phone what that music is for you. If you're in the shopping mall and you hear a jam and you're wanting to, you know, figure out what it is so you can rock out to it in your car. That's how you do it. But that works really easily for recorded music because it never changes. There's not background noise usually when you're recording this kind of music because you're, you know, in the store, but usually it's really quite loud. And with birds and nature, you have things like wind is an acoustic nightmare for people trying to do monitoring. But also, if you're doing birds like me during the middle of the day or dawn chorus and your birds have short little calls that they like to be little DJs and remix. It makes it really, really challenging. So I am investigating that, but my focus is around answering that question that you speak to of, should we do it? Are there ways to engage people that are beneficial and interesting and engaging? Because we aren't sure. Right now, it hasn't been very engaging. So my research is exploring that kind of question. So hi, I'm Andrew Topmakov from TURN. I'm going to look at my slides just to make sure I know what I'm doing. Yeah, so um, I'm an engineer as opposed to a computer scientist, so I don't research AI. I look into using it, basically. We get tasked with building systems that can solve problems. Um, so in the context of that, we're looking at using AI for two things. I guess the most important one is the image classification and clustering there. Um, that's basically saying, OK, look, um, plop some images into a system and it'll tell you if it's a kangaroo or a you know, rabbit or something. So this can be interesting and useful for camera traps and we're sort of looking into infrastructure there um, at a national level to try and facilitate those sorts of services. Um, also another example for clustering, for example, could be condition monitoring where you've got a whole bunch of photo points and you want to be able to sort of classify, well first, no, you, cl you cluster them into certain types of condition based upon the mechanics of the actual uh, images. So that's some things that we're looking at using, and ultimately there's a lot of infrastructure available now. You don't have to you know, code up your own systems specifically. There's all sorts of cloud-based services for this kind of stuff. So we'll be looking into integrating with those sorts of things and leveraging the existing stuff rather than uh, rolling our own. Um, and the second one I've put up there is about identification keys. Um, this is actually in the context of Wild Orchid Watch. Um, so Quite often in ecology, like I said, I'm an engineer, computer engineer, so I'm not an ecologist. I learn from them. They're the ones who set all this stuff. Um, that you use that for taxonomic identification. So there's a whole bunch of questions. So you know, how tall is, is it? More than 15 centimeters tall? Is it you know, purple? Whatever. So this is essentially encoded knowledge, and so this is ultimately something which can be put into a computer system quite easily. And one of the options there is to use a chatbot style interface, which makes it more conversational. So rather than lots of drop downs and filling in information, you can just basically have a conversation with a, with a bot, and that'll walk you through that knowledge. So that's just a couple of options that we're looking at. Um, yeah, that's likely it. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so my background in terms of why I'm sitting at the front here at the moment is I've been running Digivolve for about seven years now. and. Um, uh, the, the number of camera trap images and the involvement of citizen scientists in identifying camera trap images um, leaves me a little bit conflicted, I guess, in terms of uh, uh, machine learning and AI has great capacity to learn and help identify the animals that have been captured in camera trap images. Um, but on the other hand, I've seen how engaged and how uh, thrilled people are to be involved 
in uh, identifying camera trap you know, species in camera trap images in projects like wildlife spider and digivol, and I would hate that uh, engagement and education opportunity to be lost. So I can see that <clears throat> machine learning. Uh, I guess the I, I'm. I'd like to see machine learning used to remove those images that people really don't want to have to look at, that have got nothing in them, they're false positives, and the ones which they're not supposed to look at, which have got humans in them, and from a privacy perspective is an issue, and then um, and maybe uh, compartmentalise them into broader groups. But I don't want, I'd really like to see citizen science continue to be um, engaged and involved in identifying the animals in those images from an educational perspective, an engagement perspective, and I'd hope uh, an accuracy perspective. So, um, yeah, a little bit conflicted about being uh, involved in, a, in uh, projects that involve machine learning and, and um, their capacity to, to take on roles that uh, citizen scientists have been so engaged and involved with.